In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Both my father and my grandfather were volunteer firemen in the Pike Township Volunteer Fire Department. Pike Township is now part of Indianapolis. Pike Fire Station Number 1 was just a few blocks from my grandparents' house in what was then known as New Augusta. This meant I could get a fire, a, a fire station tour anytime I wanted. In 1972, when I was just nine years old, a TV show premiered on Channel 6 called Emergency. Emergency was the story of two paramedics of Los Angeles County Fire Station Number 51 and the doctors at Rampart Hospital's emergency room. Every Saturday night, as if in preparation for Sunday's worship service, my father and I would watch Emergency with my dad filling in all the firefighter gaps. Paramedics John Gage and Roy DeSoto rescued hikers from cliffs, used the jaws of life on accident victims, and administered IVs with normal saline or D5W on the instructions over the biophone from Rampart's Dr. Brackett, Dr. Early, and of course, Nurse Dixie McCall, who kept everyone in line. My dad and I came to recognize a pattern in the show. At least once per show, one of the runs would involve more than just Station 51, sometimes a full first alarm. When that would happen, my dad and I would look at each other and say, oh, it's the big one. And sure enough, there'd be a major structure fire or an oil refinery on fire, or maybe even a fire on a boat in Long Beach Harbor. Of course, they weren't real fires. They were just special effects. Most of them obviously on some Hollywood backlot. I still watch the repeats of Emergency, I've got several seasons recorded on my DVR, and I usually watch an episode on Saturday night just for old time's sake. I'm disappointed at how artificial the Hollywood backlot fires look compared to today's special effects. But when that time of the show arrives, when the dispatcher calls not just Station 51, but Truck 127, Station 19, and Battalion 14, I still say out loud, oh, it's the big one. In today's Old Testament reading from Exodus chapter 3, Moses comes across a fire. A bush was burning, but not consumed. Today we probably th would probably think it's a trick of some kind, maybe look around for wires or other, other evidence of the trick. Moses is intrigued also and says, I will set aside and see this great sight, which the bush is not burning. We've given, we're given a spoiler, of course. Verse 2 tells us that the angel of the Lord is appearing to Moses in the flame. Fire can be very helpful to our daily lives, can't it? It can provide warmth on a cool night. It can provide heat to boil water to fix your dinner. You can roast hot dogs and marshmallows during a bonfire on the beach. Fire can pr provide atmosphere on the ends of candles for a nice dinner. And like the fire of the burning bush that Moses saw, it can remind us of God's presence, as does the sanctuary light. Fire, of course, can be quite destructive. That's why we have firemen like the men of the fictitious Station 51. If your house is on fire, you don't run to the refrigerator to get hot dogs and fixins for s'mores. You call the fire department and you get out. Fire also purifies. On the day of Pentecost, we're told that tongues of fire rested on the heads of the apostles, like Moses' bush, not burning their heads and setting their hair on fire, but showing the presence of the Holy Spirit, the great purifier of our souls. We can say then that fire is a gift from God, and like most gifts from God, gifts like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it must be used properly or it may reap destruction. God is appearing to Moses for a specific purpose, to commission him to lead his enslaved people out of Egypt and into a land flowing with milk and honey. In trying to convince God to send someone else, Moses wants to know, hey, if they ask me what's his name, what do I tell him? God says to Moses, I am who I am. Now this is a loaded and complicated phrase and much has been written about it. The Hebrew word is YHWH and although it is almost always translated in the present tense in English, there's no present tense for this word in Hebrew. See what I mean about it being loaded and complicated. Nonetheless, for us meager English speakers, it is fair to say that the God speaking to Moses we can fairly call the Supreme Being. And what is this Supreme Being like? How can we describe Him? We do that, of course, every time we say the creeds. God is Creator. God is Redeemer in Jesus Christ. 
God is sustainer of his church in the Holy Spirit. But what else? Today's readings, all of them, give us a picture of the Supreme Being. Some of what we see in those readings make God seem difficult. Others make God seem good, even great. Throughout our readings, God gives warnings to his people, which makes God seem perhaps difficult. When Moses approaches the burning bush, God says, do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground, a warning about God's holiness. In our New Testament reading from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul reminds the Corinthians of a couple of Old Testament episodes which should serve as warnings to the New Testament Christians. First, do not be idolaters as some of them were. An idol is anything that is more important to you than God. A couple of ancient saints give us an idea of what idolatry can look like. It is said that St. Augustine once noted that the gift cannot be greater than the giver. Life is a gift, God is the giver. Which do we cherish more? St. Maximus the Confessor writes this in the seventh century. Charity is a right attitude of mind which prefers nothing to knowledge of God. If we possess any strong attachment to things of this earth, we cannot possess true charity. For anyone who really loves God prefers to know and experience God rather than his creatures. The whole set and longing of such a person's mind is ever directed toward God. For God is far superior to all his creation, since everything which exists has been made by God and for God. And so in deserting God, who is beyond compare, for the inferior works of creation, we show that we value God, the author of creation, less than creation itself. Back to St. Paul. He mentions a story found in Numbers 25. We must not indulge in immorality, as some of them did. This immorality results in 23,000 dying in a single day. And third, Paul mentions a story found a little earlier in Numbers chapter 21. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did. Those people were destroyed by serpents. St. Paul carefully reminds the Corinthians these things happened to them as a warning, but they were written down for our instruction. Warnings to the Old Testament folks, instructions for the New Testament folks. In our gospel, our Lord references similar episodes, but more recent to his audience. Listen to the first part of our gospel again. There were some present at that very time who told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Two recent episodes where some have died and the people think themselves better, not just better off, than those who have died. Not as many people died as those Old Testament episodes, but the attitude that results is just as troublesome, and our Lord addresses this. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And by the way, he says that twice. That is, just because you're still alive doesn't mean you're any better than they are. See what I mean about things about God being difficult? Let's move on to some good news. Back to our Old Testament reading. God says to Moses through the burning bush, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to go to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's what God sends Moses to do, to go to Pharaoh and bring forth God's people out of Egypt. God sends Moses to rescue his people from slavery to the Egyptians. Kind of reminds me of how God becomes a man, Jesus, the word of God, to rescue his people from slavery to sin. In Corinthians, St. Paul gives good news before that bad news I mentioned before. He reminds the Corinthians how the supreme being had guided the people out of Egypt by fire and cloud and provided them supernatural food and water 
as only the Supreme Being could. And after the bad news I've already mentioned, that last verse in today's reading, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And that's quite a promise, isn't it? Whatever it is you're tempted by, whether it's money, sex, or power, or donuts, or Twitter, or baseball, God will provide a way of escape. But the really good news is there at the end of today's gospel. Our Lord tells a parable of a fig tree that is not producing fruit. Three years, no fruit. The owner tells the vine dresser to cut it down and use the ground more profitably. But the vine dresser says, let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. In other words, there's still time to make things right, right? There is still time for what the liturgy calls amendment of life. As long as our hearts are still beating and we're still breathing, there is time to heed these warnings in Scripture and to seek God the Creator rather than His creation. We didn't see the warning signs. That seems to be always what the teachers, parents, and friends of that student who shoots up a high school, or when someone becomes addicted to drugs or alcohol, or even when someone's diagnosed with a debilitating illness. About five years after Emergency premiered on Channel 6, another notable incident took place in Indianapolis. I was in eighth grade, and when I got out of school and got on the bus, Mrs. Clark, our bus driver, she told us we had missed all the news that had been happening that day. This was 1977, long before the 24-hour news cycle or even very many live shots on the local news. But apparently, this had been on TV all day long. A man named Tony Karitsis had taken a mortgage banker named Richard Hall hostage. Karitsis had fallen behind on his mortgage payments, and when Hall refused to give him more time, Karitsis thought Hall wanted to foreclose and sell the property at a high profit. In Hall's office in downtown Indianapolis, Karitsis wired the muzzle of a sawed-off shotgun to the back of Hall's head. The wire was connected to the trigger and to Hall's neck. It was the first ever case of a dead man's line, and there were several imitators in the years following. If the police shot Karitsis, the shotgun would go off and kill Hall. The standoff lasted 63 hours. The first televised part was the two men walking through the streets of downtown Indianapolis. Karitsis commandeered a police car and took Hall to his apartment on the west side of town, a place called Crestwood Village. Karitsis spent much of the the time on the phone with Fred Heckman, news director at local radio station WIBC. The police were able to end the standoff by offering Karitsis a false deal, $5 million and no prosecution or arrest. They lied to him and he believed them. When Karitsis freed Hall, he fired the shotgun in the air to prove that it was loaded. He was immediately arrested and then tried. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, why do I tell this story? Because no one saw any warning, any warning signs about Karitsis. People who knew him were surprised. He was described as an always helpful, kind to his neighbors, a hard worker, and a strict law and order sort of man. Now, there's another odd part of this story, but I'm gonna save that for those who join us for the adult forum on Tuesday. Didn't see the warning signs. Here they are in front of us. In Numbers chapter 25, 23,000 die because they indulged in immorality. In Luke 13, 18 died when the tower of Siloam fell and, kill, fell and killed them. Our Lord says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And the Lord who says this, we believe, is the same Lord who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, who is the supreme being, the same Lord we mean when we say, the word of the Lord, and Lord have mercy in our liturgy. Let us be keen to watch for the warning signs from the Lord in Scripture and in life. And where we need to repent, let us do that. Confessions are Saturday at 4 in the chapel. Today's psalm ends with, For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul clings to you, and your right hand holds me fast. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen.